Now, I'm looking out, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of heads bobbing up there. It reminds me of uh, the story of the, the seminarian that had joined the Episcopal Church, and he was assigned to a rural church in New England. And he went out there, and uh, he prepared for this first sermon in that church, and he did his due duty, and he did a good job. And he got there Sunday morning, and he got up in the pulpit, and he looked out, and there was one Terry Farmer in the church. He thought, well, what am I going to do here? He thought, I'm not going to fail. So he went through the whole start of the service and they sang a song, they sang hymns, and they did communion. And then he got to the sermon and he gave the guy a full hour's sermon. <laughs> and at the very end, he gave an altar call. The guy didn't come up. <laughs> but afterwards, he went up to him and he said, well, how did I do? And this farmer in the typical New England accent said, well, pastor, he said, if I go, if I fill my, if I fill my cart to feed my cows and only one shows up, I don't feed them the full cart. <laughs> So we'll just see how we do this morning. <laughs> now this is the last in the series on being. And we'll go on from here uh, into other topics. But today is on being. How do we be in this world? And it is quite a challenge today because it is a difficult world. It is a post-Christian world. And they're not always interested in what you have to say or what you have to be. And it can be quite challenging. And you can get it in the face for some of the things that you say. Uh, and because of that, sometimes we don't say the things that we should say. Now, this is not the first time that the church has faced this sort of a hostile uh, attitude, a hostile culture. Now, we lived in uh, France for eight years. It was a wonderful experience in terms of uh, learning about the church and the history of the church in Europe. And there were some fascinating things, like when the king of France got mad at the Pope and he packed up his army, they marched down to Rome and took captive the Pope. <laughs> and they brought him back to France and established him in Avignon. And the rest of the church said, that's not right. So they elected a new pope and established him in Rome. And the, uh, the Spaniards said, that's not right. And so they elected another pope, a Spanish pope. And at that period in history, we had three popes. You know, kind of an interesting thing. I've been to Avignon. Matter of fact, we held an outreach in Avignon. But at one point in the history in France, there was, of course, the Reformation, that John Calvin, who uh, studied and uh, worked in Paris and then moved to Geneva. And there was a big political reaction. There were the Catholics and the Protestants. And the Protestants would sneak over the border from Switzerland, clandestine, and they would preach the gospel throughout the south of France. And the army had the responsibility to catch these guys, put them in jail, and sometimes take their lives. Uh, but it was illegal to be a Protestant. And this was the Huguenot, uh, Huguenot group. And uh, fascinating experience to travel in that area, which we did. Not just, um, I think 40 minutes from where we lived, was the place of the uh, uh, Durand family. And they had, they, they show you in this house that has been preserved, uh, they had a, uh, uh, a fireplace where you could move the bricks aside and there was this <laughs> hole underneath it where they would hide the preacher from 
Geneva. And then they would put the brakes back on and they would pour the, they would start the fire over when the soldiers were coming through. And the question, of course, was I wonder if that affected, affected his preaching on hellfire. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was serious stuff. I mean, you know, hide the preacher under the, under the fire of the, and there was this, this little girl called Marie Gilbert. And uh, she was about 18, if I remember correct. And they caught her, and they caught her brothers, and they sent her to a tower in the south of France called Aigues Mortes. And we had visited that and climbed the tower. And there were about six ladies that were imprisoned there for 26 years because they believed in the gospel. Now, it was a political thing rather than a religious, a religious thing, actually. But every year they would come to him and say, listen, just celebrate a mass. Celebrate a mass and we'll send you home. Some of them did. But there was Marie, and she was the, the leader of that group. And she took her knitting needles, and there in the stone that surrounded the, the hole in the middle of the room, she wrote, she scratched with her knitting, knitting needles, resiste, hold true to your faith what? in the gospel. And we, we, we saw it there. We saw resiste, scratched by Marie Durand. And the strange thing, the French Revolution, which was in no way a godly revolution, 26 years later, they sent representatives down to Aigues to release Marie Durand. And she returned to her home in the south of France, and it wasn't a couple of months before she died. She spent her life being true to the gospel. Wow. Now, this is just one point in the history of the church where people have stood strong in a situation where the culture was resistant to the gospel. And we have a, a system that is going a full 50% of our culture is probably resistant to the gospel into an alternate lifestyle that is definitely post-Christian. And so it's, it can be tough to live a Christian life in this culture. So we need to think about how do we live today, through the week, rather than just Sunday. How do we live the truth of our faith as we go out into the world? Now John Wimber had uh, an expression that he, he used to say regularly, and it was, everybody gets the flag meaning that there was this thing of entering into that power of the gospel expressed to other people around you. Everybody gets the flag, and it's as true today as it was then. God is as powerful in you as it was in them. That is true. God is not an elitist. He doesn't have a special few, and they're the ones that get to do the good stuff. Everybody gets the flag. And so we want to talk about that, and we are going to talk about things that, I say, well, I've heard that before. It's not true. We just need to practice it. And we need to look. We need to see God as we go into this world. This world is upside down. Uh, we have... We have the, the government that encroaches on us, that is talking about the First Amendment. Uh, we even have a, a speaker uh, that has been telling the church what they can believe and what they can do. I, I couldn't believe it when I heard it. Um, there is a campaign of fear that comes from many sources to try and control us. Now, fear is the enemy of faith. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says that perfect love casts out all fear. We have 
nothing to fear. Well, if you do, there's great hope for you. But you have to come and, and, and deal with the reality that you have nothing to fear. In my life, I've looked down the barrel of an M1, uh, during the revolution, I looked down the, the barrel of an uh, M1 carbine, because I didn't pull the, the trigger. Nobody shot me. I, uh, I had an accident where uh, my, my car was coming down a, uh, a hill, and the, there was oil on the road. And so when I hit my brakes, they locked up. And I released them, hit them again, and they, they locked up again. And so I'm going into a T-junction, and I hit the curb, and, and I firmly believe the scripture that says, call upon the Lord and you shall be saved. And more than just your spirituals, I believe that physically God will save you. Yeah. And I tried to call upon the Lord, and all I got out was, Lord, I didn't even get the full name out. I, w I hit that curb, which puts the car into the air, and I hit a brick wall, now, it's interesting because I, as, I'm th as I've thought about this over the years, I had to hit that brick wall at just the right spot. There was a tree to my left, there was a pole to my right, and I hit that wall and the thing fell down. And rather than crunching me, which it should have, it became a bridge. And I rolled into this guy's backyard and I ruined my car. <laughs> So, you know, I'm sitting there, and I'm in shock, and I open the door, and I get out of the car, and I walk around to the, the passenger side, and I'm standing there looking, not a scratch on me, looking at my car, and the owner of the house comes out, and he's looking at the car, and he says, where's the driver? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Now, I missed it. What I should have said, do you know what God did? <laughs> but I said, me? That wall became a bridge. God protected me. Now, there, there has been a lot of abuse by, uh, by some evangelists, by some preachers, saying, come to Christ and everything will be wonderful. Come to Christ and every, you will be rich. Come to Christ and you will go to heaven on an inner spring mattress drinking Coca-Cola. <laughs> Yeah. There's been stuff like that. Now, I know who I'm talking to out here. You know that life can be difficult and things can happen. But I am convinced as I read the Old Testament and the New Testament that God steps in. And more times than not, he protects. He turns aside. He makes it for good rather than destruction. That is my experience in life. The wall falls down. My child that should have drowned was snatched out of the water by, by Debbie. He was alone and he fell into the pool and God said, find the child. She went out there and there he was on the bottom of the pool and she pulled him out. And he turns out to be the smartest kid in the family. <laughs> you know, you've got, you've got five minutes before irreparable damage. You know, I, you can't explain these things. Yeah. God is there for us. And yes, bad things do happen. Yes, the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. <coughs> but the just kind of make a shadow out of it. <laughs> God will bring us through. Now when in, in the 23rd Psalm it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now you notice in there it says, yea, though you walk through. It doesn't say, you know, put up your tent, <laughs> build a cabin. <laughs> no, he's taking you through. God will bring you through the difficult part. God is there with you. He says in Jeremiah, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's the truth. He is there in the worst moments. 
in the times when you think you will die, and you don't. And somehow, he turns it to good. I cannot believe it. Somehow, says in Romans 8, he turns it for good. This is the walk that we walk. Now, we need to walk every day with God. When you're alone, you need to walk with God. Now, most of us get caught up with what's going on on the computer, what's on the television, you know, what that, that thing that I need to do on the car, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to walk with God every day, and it starts with prayer. That was Jeremiah uh, chapter 23, by the way. God is with us. And it starts with prayer. <coughs> prayer is simply talking with God. You don't need your big sounding words or authoritative words. All you need is, hey, I'm here. I need you. Do you hear me? Now, for 40 odd years, my life was busy. I was out in the townships. I was building shacks. I was, I was building um, preschools for children, uh, running food in for, for people that were hungry. I was busy, 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 busy with stuff. And now we retire here in the United States. But I am in a shack. It's not a house. I have in town here. And my ministry changes. And now I find that my ministry is often full. Now, a lot of you have the same experience that I do. You have trouble sleeping at night. Pain wakes you up. Thoughts wake you up. And I found that I often wake up at 3 a.m. It's crazy, 3 a.m. And so uh, I, was, I was working with the, uh, the Chinese church on the other side of town. And uh, they said, well, listen, we're going to do a, it, this is 2019, they said, we're going to do a, a, a prayer vigil. What time would you like? I said, hey, I'm up at 3 a.m. <laughs> and they said, great. And so I started praying at 3 a.m. and I've been praying at 3 a.m. ever since. Not only that, but God makes me up at 3 a.m. I wake up, I look over at the, at the clock, 3 a.m. I don't know how that works. But we pray at 3 a.m. And in the scripture, it talks about the night watchman. Now here's what the night watchman was. When you had a town, back in the time of David, etc., It had a wall, and they assigned a night watchman to watch all night long. His job was to watch out for the bad guys. An invading army, thieves, things like that. And he would watch and he'd call up, you know, 3 a.m., all is well, you know, etc., etc. I think God is calling some of us to be night watchmen. If you're gonna wake up at 3 a.m. anyway, you might as well start praying about things as the Lord leads you. God wants us to pray. And 3 a.m. is a nice time, actually. Just don't wake up your wife. <laughs> there is, prayer is mighty. There are things that I've been praying about for a long time, and suddenly I discover God has answered that prayer. And I go, wow, isn't that wonderful? God answers prayer. Now, I do not have the gift of intercession. I know what that gift is. I have been protected by it many times as a missionary. But we all have the right and the pleasure of praying. And you can pray at all situations. If you drive in Colorado Springs, you better start praying. <laughs> Especially when you know somebody cuts off three lanes 
and make it left hand turn. You better, you better stop turning. <laughs> we need prayer. We need prayer for our nation. We need prayer for our city. We need prayer for for the generation that is before us. We need prayer. Now, another thing that we need in being today is the word of God. This is the most amazing book that has ever been written. There is no book like it. It has, what is it, 66 authors? And yet the consistency of what you find here, this was not written by man. They couldn't put it together. God inspired in uh, 2 Timothy 4, it says that this book is God breathed and is useful for all instruction so that the man of God should know what he should do. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4. God breathed. That is the Greek translation of the word inspired. God breathed. There's something different about the word of God. And when you read it, sometimes you go, I never saw that before. Wow. Look at what that means. Look at what that does. The word of God is powerful. Sharper than the two-edged sword. We need the word of God, and we need it daily. Well, how do we grab a hold of it? Well, you read it. There is a book called the uh, one the one year Bible that will take you in one year all the way through the Bible. But even if you grab a hold of one or two passages a day, things are going to happen. You'll find that they will show up in your life. Now, the first time this happened to me, I was I was getting ready to to uh, uh, choose a mission field. And I had no idea how important this was going to be for me. Everywhere I went in the space of three months, they all choose, chose the same passage. It was uh, uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given you a spirit of fear, parenthesis timidity, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And I was going to France. Boy, did I need that particular. And everywhere I went, they said, our passage for today is 2 Timothy 1, 7. <laughs> huh? It just pounded me like that. And I began to see how important, you know, I needed that passage. And down throughout my entire ministry, that passage has followed me. And today, God has not given us fear. Fear has nothing to do with us. He's given us a threefold blessing of power, love, and of a sound mind. Slash self discipline. That's the translation that goes along with it. Threefold blessing. Rather than the fear that the news and the politicians and, and the CDC and everybody else wants to give you, we live a different way. And we live as overcomers, as we find in Romans. You are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. When you face that day, there's got to be something in your spirit. Something that says, yeah. There, there's, a, there's a funny movie. Uh, movie isn't terribly spiritual, mind you. But there's, there's a spot in it, and it's called Michael. Some of you may have seen it. Okay. So the, 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 the story is that Michael the angel fell from heaven. Okay, he got drunk. And uh, he's, he's losing his feathers, and he smokes. And, and some journalist is going to expose him, and so they, they go to visit him. But they're, they're trying to take him somewhere to, to take him to the Washington, D.C. or something. And they stop the car for a break. And he gets out of the car, and he walks into a field, and he hears this this bull sitting in the field. And uh, Michael looks up and he sees this bull and the bull sees him and he's, he gets this look on his face and he says, battle! 
and the bull starts snorting him. And Michael and the bull come charging together and they go head to head, knocks Michael flat on his back and the bull goes all the way back over. And you look at Michael and he's got this smile on his face because certain angels go, man, how about it? Michael being cheap. But this is hysterical. You know, some of us go nuts about it too. Spiritual battle, not all of us, but spiritual battle. I don't know, what, know why we went there, but we did. <laughs> but the Word of God, now how do I get a hold of the Word of God? I memorize it. And well, one of the things we had to do in seminary was memorize certain scriptures. Like for example, um, we memorized uh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, where it says he, which means God, gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teacher, which is one word, it says to um, equip the saints for ministry. And then here's, here's the interesting thing. And then it says, till we all grow up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And when, when I was measuring it, Debbie and I came up with a rap. And it was, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. <laughs> to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now you can use things like this to grab on, and there'll be times in your life when you need that scripture. You can use rap. You can use song. Like we have, um, however we work this button, where do I point this thing? Point it up, point it down, point it. All right, now look at this. Now we're gonna look at this scripture too because it's important for our day. How am I doing time-wise? Probably going too long. Um, anyone remember this song? This, of course, is from... Uh, um, Isaiah 55. Hold everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the water. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Uh, come ye buy wine, milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Now, in the Jesus movement, many of our songs were scriptures. Now, this one was, Oh, everyone that thirsteth, Come ye to the water, he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hallelujah. Now listen, think about today. How much of our labor, our activity, is spent in things that really doesn't satisfy. Temporary stuff. Now that which satisfies, now when it talks about thirst, thirst for what? Water. What water? Is he talking there about water? What do you think? What's water? He's the source of the water, right? The living water. Okay? Hunger. What's hunger? Hunger for bread. bread. Who's the bread of life? Jesus. Okay, now we're getting to the real meaning of this. And this thing, once you've got that in your mind, interesting thing about memory, song is stored in a different place. Now, I can be corrected, but I think that even uh, Alzheimer's is defeated by memory of song that you could remember things that have been memorized in song. But look at that. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good. Let your soul delight itself in fatness. The word of God is good unto all things. All things. And we need to take it in richly. Every day. Now that's going to change your attitude. That's going to change your loneliness. 
That's going to drive away fear. And that's why we need to take in the word of God. It says in Psalm 119, the word is a light unto my feet. It says furthermore in 119, uh, in 119 it says that I have hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's 100. I've hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now I say, that's one of the things I was going to say at the very start. Because I am a pilgrim just like you are a pilgrim. Nobody has arrived. All of us are moving forward. And Paul says, run the race so that you might win. Okay, I've got a conundrum here. And the conundrum is there's a second verse a second scripture that I put up here, and I forgot what it is. I do, Romans 2. Hold on a moment. How do I advance this thing? <clears throat> okay, there we are, all right. Now, um, one of the greatest things that is happening today is we are being told, conform to this world, conform to the philosophies, conform to the perspective, the way we look at humanity, the way we look at business, the way we look at the world, conform to this world. Um, we are not to conform to this world. The more that you study the script, we need to bathe ourselves in the scripture so that we express God's view, the light, the truth, the reality, the changing of things. And it comes from a knowledge of him that is found in the word. We need that desperately, and we need it every day. It doesn't happen from one time on Sunday, and maybe one Bible, uh, Bible class on a, on a weekday. We need the word of God. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then grace is given unto you. Okay. Now, what this ends up with we need to be available to God. We need to say to God every day, okay, God, what do you got for me today? If you're going to do the stuff, you got to show up. you got to be willing. Now, I had a crazy experience last night. I was walking out of Safeway. I had been in Safeway getting groceries, and I noticed that there was this Mexican lady, and she kept looking in my cart. And I thought, what in the world is this? Uh, you know, but I didn't think much of it. Uh, and I got out into the parkway, and I'd loaded my stuff, and I took the cart and put it in the, in the cart bin. And I was walking back to my car, and I walked by her car, and her passenger windows were rolled down, and she's going, hey, hey, hey. And so I turned around and came back, and she started telling me her story. And I noticed that her license plate was from Texas. And I suspect that she wasn't. I suspect that she was from Mexico. And she started telling me about, oh, well, you know, I've been trying to, to rent, and it's really expensive, and uh, hotels are really expensive, and, you know, and on and on and on and on. She said, you know what I really need is for some old man to take me to his property somewhere out in the... She was propositioned. And I thought, what? <laughs> I said, well, lady, I can't, I don't can't help you, but I can pray for you. And I stopped and I prayed for her. And then I think the Lord said, get out of there. <laughs> and I did. He didn't have to say it twice. But here's the thing. I was able to pray for this lady and bless her in the name of Jesus. Um, and then 
protect my safety by, you know, getting out of there. But again, I was available. I put myself in harm's way. And I'm not saying, you know, back, I, it was just when, there were many times when I just walked away. But in that situation, I was available. We, each one of us, need to be available for the situation that God puts us in. God has much that he wants to do in this world. And you are his secret spy. God wants to use you as his agent. And you, you're to do the stuff. You're to bless them. You're to call for healings. Uh, you're to be an ear to hear their problems, uh, and you're to bring down the kingdom of God. Now, the final thing is daily we need to worship the Lord. God is worthy of worship every day of the week, not just on Sunday. And even at 3 a.m. I haven't woken Debbie up yet, I don't think. God is worthy of worship. That is the most wonderful thing in the world, to worship the living God. And we, anywhere, regularly, and we need, and we receive the joy of the Lord. It changes us. It heals us. In 1970, 71, uh, I was in Southern California. I had been attending a meeting at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And I was singing uh, this song. I, I lived in Temple City, which is an hour away. I was singing the song, why, why Does He Love Me So? Why did my Savior to Calvary go? Why, did he, why does he love me so? As a young man, I had closed myself off to all emotion. That was the way of, of protecting myself from a very uh, bad situation in my family. And so I could not feel. And as I was singing this on the freeway, God broke me wide open. And I began to weep. I wept so badly that I couldn't drive. I had to pull over to the side of the road. And God healed me, healed my emotions. From that point on, I could feel. And I could feel for people that were in need because in worship God heals us. We need worship and we must do it. And we're going to stop there because otherwise we're going to be here a, a long time.